Part One of Attitude by Hal Clement. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Attitude by Hal Clement. This story was first published in Astounding Science Fiction, September 1943. Part One. Doctor Little woke up abruptly with a distinct sensation of having just stepped over a precipice. His eyes flew open and were greeted by the sight of a copper-colored metal ceiling a few feet above. It took him several seconds to realize that it was keeping its distance, that he was not falling either toward or away from it. When he did, a grimace of disgust flickered across his face. He had lived and slept through enough days and nights in interstellar space to be accustomed to weightlessness. He had no business waking up like a cadet on his first flight, grasping for the nearest support. He had no business waking up at all in these surroundings. He shook his head. His mind seemed to be working on slow time, and his pulse, as he suddenly realized, as the pounding in his temples forced itself on his awareness, must be well over a hundred. This was not his room. The metal of the walls was different, the light was different, an orange glow streaming from slender tubes running along the junction of wall and ceiling. He turned his head to take in the rest of the place, and an agonizing barrage of pins and needles shot the length of his body. An attempt to move his arms and legs met with the same result, but he managed to bend his neck enough to discover that he was enveloped to the shoulders in a sack-like affair bearing all the earmarks of a regulation sleeping bag. The number stenciled on the canvas was not his own, however. In a few minutes he found himself able to turn his head freely, and proceeded to take advantage of the fact by examining his surroundings. He found himself in a small chamber, walled completely with the coppery alloy. It was six-sided, like the cells in a beehive. The only opening was a circular hatchway in what little considered the ceiling, though in a second-order flight it might as well have been a floor or wall. There was no furniture of any description. The walls were smooth, lacking even the rings normally present to accommodate the anchoring straps of a sleeping bag. There was a light shining through the grill which covered the hatchway but from where he was Little could make out no details through the bars. He began to wriggle his toes and fingers, ignoring as best he could the resulting sensations, and in a few minutes he found himself able to move with little effort. He lay still a few minutes longer, and then unsnapped the top fasteners of the bag. The grill interested him, and he was becoming more and more puzzled as to his whereabouts. He had no recollection of any unusual events. He had been checking over the medical stores, he was sure, but he couldn't recall retiring to his room afterward. What had put him to sleep? And where had he awakened? He grasped the top of the bag and peeled it off, being careful to keep hold of it. He started to roll it up and paused in astonishment. A cloud of dust fine as smoke, was oozing from the fibers of the cloth with each motion, and hanging about the bag like an atmosphere. He sniffed at it cautiously and started coughing. The stuff was dry and tickled his throat unpleasantly. There could be only one explanation. The bag had been drifting in open space for a length of time sufficient to evaporate every trace of moisture from its fibers. He unrolled it again and looked at the stenciled number. GOA IIII NA twelve four twenty two. The first three groups confirmed his original belief that the bag had belonged to the Gomesium. The last was a personal number indicating the identity of the former owner, but little could not remember whose number it was. The fact that it had been exposed to the void was not reassuring. Dismissing that phase of the problem for the moment, the doctor rolled the bag into a tight bundle. He was drifting weightless midway between ceiling and floor, almost in the center of the room. The hatchway was in one of the six corners of the ceiling. Little hurled the bundle in the opposite direction. 
It struck the far corner and rebounded without much energy. Air friction brought it to a halt a few feet from the wall. The doctor drifted more slowly in the direction of the grating. His throw had been accurate enough to send him within reach of it. He caught hold of one of the bars and drew himself as close as possible. Any lingering doubt that might have remained in his still befuddled brain as to whether or not he were still on board the Gomesia was driven away as he caught his first glimpse through the grill. It opened, or would have opened had it been unlocked, on to a corridor which extended in two directions as far as the doctor's limited view could reach. The hallway was about thirty feet square, but there its orthodox characteristics terminated. It had been built with a sublime disregard for any possible preferred up or down direction. Hatches opened on all four sides. Those opposite little station were circular like his own, while those on the side walls were rectangular. From a point beside each opening a solidly braced metal ladder extended to the center of the corridor, where it joined a heavy central pillar plentifully supplied with grips for climbing. Everything was made of the copper-like material, and the only light came from the orange glow-tubes set in the corners of the corridor. Dr. Little maintained his position for several minutes, looking and listening, but no sound reached his ears, and he could perceive nothing through the gratings which covered the other hatchways. He also gave a few moments' attention to the lock on his own grating, which evidently was operated from either side, but it was designed to be opened by a complicated key, and the doctor had no instruments for examining its interior. With a sigh he hooked one arm about a bar of the grating and relaxed, trying to reason out the chain of events which had led up to these peculiar circumstances. The Gomesia had been a heavy cruiser, quite capable of putting up a stiff defense to any conceivable attack. Certainly no assault could have been so sudden and complete that the enemy would be in a position to use hand-weapons on the crew before an alarm was raised. The idea was absurd, and fixed-mount projectors of any type would have left more of a mark on the doctor than he could find at this moment. Furthermore, the ship had been, at the last time of which little had clear recollection, crossing the relatively empty gulf between the galaxy proper and the greater Magellanic Cloud, a most unpropitious place for a surprise attack. The star density in that region is of the order of one per eight thousand cubic parsecs, leaving a practically clear field for detector operations. No, an attack did not seem possible, and yet Little had been deprived of consciousness without warning, had been removed from the Gomesia in that state, and had awakened within a sleeping bag which showed too plainly the fact that part at least of the cruiser had been open to space for some time. Was he in a base on some planet of one of those few stars of the desert, or in some ship of unheard of design? His weightlessness disposed of the first idea before it was formulated, and the doctor glanced at his belt. Through the glass window in its case he could see the filament of his personal equalizer glowing faintly. He was in a ship in second-order flight, and the little device had automatically taken on the task of balancing the drive forces which would, without it, act unequally on each element in his body. As a further check he felt in his pocket and drew out two coins, one of copper and one of silver. He held them nearly together some distance from his body, released them carefully so as not to give them velocities of their own, and withdrew his hand. Deprived of the equalizer field, they began to drift slowly in a direction parallel to the corridor, the copper bit moving at a barely perceptible crawl, the silver rapidly gaining. The corridor, then, was parallel to the ship's line of flight, and the coins had fallen forward since the silver was more susceptible to the driving field action. Little pushed off from the ceiling and retrieved the coins, restoring them to his otherwise empty pocket. He had not been carrying instruments or weapons, and had no means of telling whether or not he had been searched while unconscious. Nothing was missing, but he had possessed nothing worth taking. 
the fact that he was locked in might be taken to indicate that he was a prisoner, and prisoners are customarily relieved of any possessions which prove helpful in an escape. Only beings who had had contact with humanity would logically be expected to identify which of the numerous gadgets carried by the average man are weapons. But the design of this craft bore no resemblance to that of any race with which Little was acquainted. He still possessed his wristwatch and mechanical pencil, so the doctor found himself unable to decide even the nature of his captors, far less their intentions. Possibly he would find out something when and if he was fed. He realized suddenly that he was both hungry and thirsty. He had been unconscious long enough for the watch to run down. Little's pulse had dropped to somewhere near normal, he noticed, as he drifted beside the hatch. He wondered again what had knocked him out without leaving any mark or causing some sensation then gave up this line of speculation in favor of the more immediate one advocated by his empty stomach. He fell asleep again before he reached any solution. He dreamed that someone had moved Rigel to the other side of the galaxy, and the navigator couldn't find his way home. Very silly, he thought, and went on dreaming it. A gong-like note, as penetrating as though his own skull had been used as the bell, woke him the second time. He was alert at once, and instantly perceived the green translucent sphere suspended a few feet away. For a moment he thought it might be one of his captors. Then his nose told him differently. It was ordinary lime juice, as carried by practically every earth cruiser. A moment's search served to locate, beside the hatchway, the fine nozzle through which the liquid had been impelled. The doctor had no drinking tube, but he had long since mastered the trick of using his tongue in such circumstances without allowing any other part of his face to touch the liquid. It was a standard joke to confront recruits on their first free flight with the same problem. If nose or cheek touched the sphere, surface tension did the rest. Little returned to the door and took up what he intended to be a permanent station there. He was waiting partly for some sign of human beings, partly for evidence of his captors, and more and more, as time wore on, for some trace of solid food. He waited in vain for all three. At intervals a pint or so of lime juice came through the jet and formed a globe in the air beside it. Nothing else. Little had always liked the stuff, but his opinion was slowly changing as more and more of it was forced on him. It was all there was to drink, and the air seemed to be rather dry. At any rate, he got frightfully thirsty at what seemed unusually short intervals. He wound his watch and discovered that the feedings came at intervals of a little over four hours. He had plenty of chance to make observations and nothing else to observe. It was not long before he was able to predict, within a few seconds, the arrival of another drink. Later he wished he hadn't figured it out. The last five or ten minutes of each wait were characterized by an almost agonizing thirst, none the less painful for being purely mental. Sometimes he slept, but he was always awake at the zero minute. With nothing to occupy his mind but fruitless speculation, it is not surprising that he lost all track of the number of feedings. He knew only that he had slept a large number of times had become deathly sick of lime juice, and was beginning to suffer severely from the lack of other food, when a faint suggestion of weight manifested itself. He looked at his equalizer the instant he noticed the sensation and found it dark. The ship had cut its second-order converters, and was applying a very slight first-order acceleration in its original line of flight. The barely perceptible weight was directed toward what Little had found to be the stern. Its direction changed by a few degrees on several occasions, but was restored each time in a few seconds. The intensity remained constant, as nearly as Little could tell, for several hours. Then it increased, smoothly but swiftly, to a value only slightly below that of Earth gravity. 
The alterations in direction became more frequent, but never sudden or violent enough to throw Little off his feet. He was now standing on the rear wall which had become the floor. Evidently the ship's pilot, organic or mechanical, well deserved the name. For nearly half an hour, by the watch, conditions remained thus. Then the drive was eased through an arc of ninety degrees, the wall containing the hatchway once more became the ceiling, and within a few minutes the faintest of tremors was perceptible through the immense hull, and the direction of gravity became constant. If this indicated a landing, Little mentally took off his hat to the entity at the controls. The doctor found himself badly placed for observation. The hatch was about four feet above the highest point he could reach, and even jumping was not quite sufficient to give him a hold on the bars. He estimated that he had nearly all of his normal hundred and ninety pounds earth weight, and lack of proper food and the last several days had markedly impaired his physical powers. It was worse than tantalizing. For suddenly, for the first time since he had regained consciousness in this strange spot, he heard sounds from outside. They were distorted by echoes sounding and reverberating along the corridor outside, and evidently originating at a considerable distance, but they were definitely and unmistakably the voices of human beings. For minutes the doctor waited. The voices came no nearer, but on the other hand they did not go any farther away. He called out, but apparently the group was too large and making too much noise of its own to hear him. The chatter went on. No words were distinguishable, but there was a prevailing overtone of excitement that not even the metallic echoes of the great hull could cover. Little listened and kept his eyes fixed on the hatchway. He heard nothing approach, but suddenly there was a faint click as the lock opened. The grill swung sharply inward until it was perpendicular to the wall in which it was set. Then the side bars of its frame telescoped outward until they clicked against the floor. The cross bars separated simultaneously, still maintaining equal distances from each other, and a moment after the hatch had opened, a metal ladder extended from it to the floor of the room. It took close examination to see the telescopic joints just below each rung. The metal tubing must be paper-thin, Little thought, to permit such construction. The doctor set foot on the ladder without hesitation. Presumably his captors were above and wanted him to leave the room in which he was imprisoned. In this wish he concurred heartily. He was too hungry to object effectively anyway. He made his way up the ladder to the corridor, forcing his shoulders through the narrow opening. The human voices were still audible, but they faded into the background of his attention as he examined the beings grouped around the hatch. There were five of them. They bore some resemblance to the non-humans of Tau Ceti's first planet, having evidently evolved from a radically symmetric starfish-like form to a somewhat more specialized type with differentiated locomotive and prehensive appendages. They were five-limbed and headless, with a spread of about eight feet. The bodies were nearly spherical, and if the arms had been only a little thicker at the base, it would have been impossible to tell where body left off and arm began. The tube feet of the terrestrial starfish were represented by a cluster of pencil-thick tendrils near the tip of each arm and leg, the distinction between these evidently lying in the fact that three of the appendages were slightly thicker and much blunter at the tips than the two which served as arms. The tendrils on the legs were shorter and stubbier as well. The bodies and the appendages nearly to their tips were covered with a mat of spines, each several inches in length, lying for the most part nearly flat against the skin. These either grew naturally or had been combed away from the central mouth and the five double-pupiled eyes situated between the limb junctions. The beings were metal mesh belts twined into the spines on their legs and these supported cases for what were probably tools and weapons. 
Their hands were empty. Evidently they did not fear an attempted escape or attack on the doctor's part. They made no sound except for the dry rustle of their spiny armor as they moved. In silence they closed in around little, while one waved his flexible arms toward one end of the passageway. A gentle shove from behind, as the doctor faced in the indicated direction, transmitted the necessary command, and the group marched toward the bow. Two of the silent things stalked in front, two brought up the rear, and, at the first opportunity, the other swarmed up one of the radial ladders and continued his journey directly over Little's head, swinging along by the handholds on the central beam. As they advanced, the voices from ahead grew slowly louder. Occasional words were now distinguishable. The speakers, however, were much farther away than the sound of their voices suggested, since the metal-walled corridor carried the sounds well, if not faithfully. Nearly three hundred yards from Little Cell, a vertical shaft of the same dimensions as the corridor interrupted the ladder. The voices were coming from below. Without hesitation the escort swung over the lip of the shaft and started down the ladder which took up its full width. Little followed. On the way he got some idea of the size of the ship he was in. Looking up he saw the mouths of two other corridors entering the shaft above the one he had traversed. At the level of the second another hallway joined it from the side. Evidently he was not near the center line of the craft. There were at least two and possibly three tiers of longitudinal corridors. He had already seen along one of the corridors. The ship must be over fifteen hundred feet in length. Four vessels the size of the Gomesia could have used the immense hull for a hangar, and left plenty of elbow room for the servicing crews. Below him the shaft debouched into a chamber whose walls were not visible from Little's position. His eyes, however, which had become exceedingly tired of the endless orange radiance which formed the ship's only illumination were gladdened at the sight of what was unquestionably daylight leaking up from the room. As he descended two of the walls became visible. The shaft opened near one corner, and in one of them he finally saw an airlock with both valves open. He went hastily down the remaining few feet and stopped as he touched the floor. His gaze took in on the instant the twenty-yard square chamber which seemed to occupy a slight outcrop of the hull, and stopped at the corner farthest from the airlock. Pinned in that corner by a line of starfish were thirty-eight beings, and little needed no second glance to identify the crew of the Gomesia. They recognized him simultaneously. The chatter stopped, to be replaced by a moment's silence, and then a shout of, Doc! from nearly two score throats. Little stared, then strode forward through the line of guards which opened for him. A moment later he was undergoing a process of hand-shaking and back-slapping that made him wonder. He didn't think he had been that popular. End of Part One